This is an example of the inverse Laplace transforms game in Circuit Tutor at level 1, or the easy level. So let's go into inverse Laplace transforms. Now normally the first step here, um, after reviewing the learning objectives, would be to do the introductory tutorial, um, which is the multiple choice exercise that will teach you the basic concepts you need to do the exercises. So it's very strongly recommended that you view that tutorial before attempting um, the exercises. So I've done that here, so I'm going to skip that right now and go in ahead into the game. And here we have three different levels of difficulty. We're going to focus here now on the easier first level. Um, as always, we have examples available at multiple levels of difficulty. So I'll just show an example at the easy level, which would help you uh, prepare for the game. And basically here it's giving you a problem that involves uh, doing a partial fraction expansion. So we have a function in the S domain, or Laplace domain, a G of S function, and we want to find its inverse transform. That would be in the time domain. So in this case, um, we see that we have uh, two linear terms in the denominator, so we will need to perform a partial fraction expansion, um, as discussed in the introductory tutorial. And so you form something in that uh, general form. And then you could use, uh, for example, the method of residues, or otherwise known as the thumb method, perhaps, um, to multiply times each of these denominators in turn and set uh, the s equal to the negative uh, value of the pole, which will then cancel out all the other terms in the expression and allow you to calculate that coefficient directly. And then we do that for each coefficient and plug those into the partial fraction expansion and then use the table of Laplace transforms, which is linked here, um, to get the inverse transform, which is a, a very standard one of an exponential and the unit step function. And finally, construct the final answer. So that would be a full uh, explained example, which you can always review um, if you need to do that. OK, there's also user-selected examples available on this exercise, which, in which case you can choose whether you want just basically an application of the table or whether you want to do uh, partial fractions with simple poles or with complex conjugate poles. Um, so that's another option for viewing examples. So right now I'm going to go ahead and work the problems at the easy level to illustrate that. So let's go into the first problem. And here we're presented with a, a fraction, basically, um, in the Laplace domain. It's a function of s, which is a Laplace transform variable, or complex frequency, otherwise known as. And we need to do a partial fraction expansion of that and then find the inverse transform of it. So. First of all, um, the first thing we're being asked for is to do the partial fraction expansion. Now, uh, sometimes people make the mistake of not reading what the question is asking and right away entering the inverse transform in the time domain. That will not be accepted here because it's asking for g of s, so this is still going to be in the Laplace domain, and again, they're asking you for the partial fraction expansion. So just like on any test, the most important thing is to read the question carefully before you start to answer it, or you'll be answering the wrong question. And it, answer would not be accepted. So since we want to be a partial fraction expansion and we want to be in the S domain, we need to use the terms on the Laplace transform tab of the palette here, not any of these time domain terms because those are functions of T rather than S, and we're not yet ready to do that part. So in the Laplace domain, um, for the partial fraction expansion, I'm going to have two fractions here added together. So I'll use, first of all, a fraction term, and I can either drag that into position or here I'll just click on it. And if you ever need to remove that, you can just drag it out of position and it automatically disappears. And you can do that with any term that you've uh, placed by mistake. Um, you can also use the clear equation uh, button down here if you've uh, badly messed up the equation and just want to start over. Um, also, there's always the option to give up on a problem. If you do get stuck, there's no penalty, as always in Circuit Tutor, for giving up on a problem. You'll simply have to work a new problem of a similar type. Um, in order to gain the full credit for the exercise. So there's never any penalty for giving up if you need to do that. And it will show you the fully worked solution um, so you can see uh, what it was you were having trouble with. Okay, so we again, we'll need a fraction term, so I'll just click on that. And then we're going to need to add to that a second fraction term, so I'll put a, a plus and then a fraction template again. And now I'll need constants in each numerator, so I'll just drag that into position here another constant. These are real constants that I need because these are uh, simply real uh, values in the in the poles. And then I'll need an s plus a um, for each of these terms in the denominator. So I'll put one of those terms here and another one down in here. 
Okay, so the first A there would be the 3, and the second one would be the 1. I'm sorry, 1. Okay, now we need to determine the numerators. That's the hard part here. And so we need to basically make this such that if we put this over a common denominator that we will recover this expression. That's the goal here. So again, this is the partial fractions method. So I'm going to, for example, to find this constant, multiply through the entire equation by s plus 3. And after doing that, that'll of course just give us the constant we want here. And then I'm going to set s equal to negative 3. And what that does is this term will then go away completely because negative 3 plus 3 is 0, so that cancels this term completely. And then over here, when I multiply by the s plus 3, that will cancel the term in the denominator, and I'll be left with 2 over s plus 1. So then when I set s equal to negative 3, I have negative 3 plus 1, which is negative 2 in the denominator. So 2 divided by negative 2, of course, would be negative 1. So that's my first coefficient is a negative 1. And you can do that on paper if you like, but um, here I think it's simple enough. I can probably do it in my head. So uh, to find this coefficient, I'm going to multiply everything through by the denominator, which is s plus 1. And so that'll multiply this by s plus 1, for example. Then I set s equal to negative 1. And that will eliminate this term, so I just have the constant on the right-hand side. And then when I multiply the s plus 1 here, that will cancel that s plus 1. So I can just imagine that, put my thumb over it or something. And then I have 2 over s plus 3. Then I set s equal to negative 1 in that remaining term. So I have negative 1 plus 3, so that's going to be 2 in the denominator. So I have 2 divided by 2 is just 1. So I'll enter a 1 for this constant. And that completes the partial fraction expansion, again, in the s domain. We're asking for g of s here, not g of, little g of t. So we'll check that. And that is correct. Now the next step is to complete the inverse transform by writing it as a function of time in the time domain. So now I'm going to need to use the time domain terms. So I'll go over to this other uh, tab that contains the correct terms there. Um, I don't have any exponential function of s, for example, in front of these terms, which would indicate time shifting um, based on the time shifting property that you could view here if you want to click on that. Um, but I don't need that here, so I'm just going to need, uh, and then I may remember that 1 over s plus a, the inverse transform of that is just e to the negative at times the unit step function. Now, if you don't remember that, you can look it up. There's a table of Laplace transforms here, um, and that's just this uh, formula here that we would need for the inverse transform. I would, however, recommend that you memorize the first three entries, at least, in this table, because they're used so frequently that it's just a shame to have to be always looking those up. So again, the 1 over s plus a is always just e to the negative at times the unit step function. We always need a unit step function basically in the time domain because remember Laplace transforms assume that the function of time is zero prior to d equals zero. That's just a basic assumption made in the unilateral uh, Laplace transform. Okay, so let's go back here. And so each term basically is gonna be a constant times uh, the exponential function. So I'm gonna just put a constant in there and then um, the exponential function. And now here's something that people sometimes forget, which is that I also need the unit step function. Now, one option there would be to actually start uh, with this term where I can put everything inside the brackets. Um, and that's certainly a, a good way to do it too. Uh, but in this case, I'm just gonna put a unit step function on each of my two terms. So I'll just do that. And then I need to add to that uh, the inverse transform of the second function, which will have exactly the same form. So that will be plus um, a constant times another exponential function times another unit step function. And again, I could have used the bracket term if I want, but I'm just doing it this way. So my first constant will be the negative 1. And then the a value um, is going to be 3 because that's 1 over s plus a. Well, times negative 1, of course. But So my a will be 3 here, not negative 3, remember, just 3. And then my second constant will be just the 1. So really, I could admit that um, or enter it as 1, either one. I, I could just drag it out. If I want to, I could just remove that term because I don't really need it. Um, and then I have e to the negative 1t. I do need to enter the 1 there. Um, and again, I've got the unit step function in both terms. So let's check that. And that is correct. And that summarizes um, the results here. 
Um, now you can also view a detailed solution at any time. And that would basically just show you all the steps um, that we just did in detail. In case you were uncertain about any of those steps, that would be a chance to review that. Okay, so now let's work the second problem at the easy level. And this time it's a little bit more complicated. Now I have a function of s in the numerator. But I still have to do a partial fraction expansion. You see that I have two poles here. Remember that one pole is located at negative 12 inverse seconds, and the other one is located at negative 10 inverse seconds. Remember that s, uh, the Laplace transform variable, is a complex frequency. So it always has units of inverse seconds, even though units are not shown here just for uh, simplicity. So once again, since I'm going to have two terms, that is two poles, I will need, uh, and, and also notice again, I'm being asked first for the partial fraction expansion, not for the inverse transform itself. That will be the next step. So to do the partial fraction expansion, I must be in the Laplace domain again, so I need to select the correct palette of terms. Okay, so now I will need uh, two fractions, basically. So I'll have one fraction plus a second fraction. And then I'll need a constant in each numerator. It's always going to be a constant. And then I have the s plus a in each denominator. So again, form that basic uh, form because we have two poles here. If I had three poles, then of course I'd have to have three terms and so forth. If I had you know, seven poles, I would need seven terms. Okay, so the first a value there will just be the 12, and the second one will be the 10. So I just enter those. And now the hard part is to find these constants in the numerators. And again, the goal is to make this such that if I put this over a common denominator, I will get back this expression. And of course, once you've done the partial fraction expansion, that's always a good way to check, is just mentally uh, form this over a common denominator and make sure that you get the original expression back. If you don't, then that would indicate that you've made a mistake. So that's a good way to check your work, particularly, for example, if you're doing it on an exam and you're not going to be told immediately whether the answer is correct or not. Okay, so let's once again um, use the method of residues or one might call it the thumb method um, to determine this coefficient. So we're going to multiply everything through by s plus 12 and that will multiply this by s plus 12 and then I set s equal to negative 12 and that will make this a zero so this term goes away and we just isolate this constant on the right hand side. So now when I multiply this by s plus 12 that term goes away. Imagine putting your thumb over it or something if you like um, and then you have s plus 8 over s plus 10 is the remainder and now uh, we will set s equal to negative 12. So we're going to have negative 12 plus 8 that would be negative 4 in the numerator and the negative 12 plus 10 which would be negative 2. So I have negative 4 divided by negative 2 would be 2. So the, the correct coefficient there should be a 2. Okay, then the second uh, part is to find this coefficient. And in order to do that, um, I will multiply everything through now by the denominator of this term, <clears throat> which is s plus 10. Then I set s equal to negative 10. So again, I'm just left with only the coefficient on the right-hand side of the equation. And over here, when I multiply by s plus 10 and set s equal to negative 10, that makes that 0 multiplying this. So this entire term goes away. So I'm left with nothing but that one coefficient on the right-hand side, which is what I want, of course, because that's what I'm trying to find. And then as I multiply s plus 10 times the left-hand side, that cancels this s plus 10. So I have s plus 10 over s plus 10. And then I set s equal to negative 10. So negative 10 plus 8 will be negative 2. And then at negative uh, 10 plus 12 will be positive 2. So I have negative 2 divided by positive 2, so that's going to be negative 1. So that will be my coefficient there. And now, if you wish, I mean, of course, we can check it with the uh, uh, check button, but just to verify it, um, we could imagine putting this over a common denominator. So for example, we'd multiply this 2 times s plus 10 would give us 2s plus 20, and then uh, we'd be subtracting s from that, so 2s minus s would give us the original s, and then uh, the 20 minus 12 would give us the 8. So that would indeed, uh, we can see right away that that's going to be the correct answer. So let's check that now. So that is correct. Okay, so now the partial fraction expansion has been printed up here for us to use, and now the next step is to enter the function of time, the actual inverse transform in the time domain. So now we need to go over and use time 
domain terms that are functions of t rather than functions of s. So we can no longer be in the Laplace domain. Now we don't have any exponential functions of s in this uh, or any factors like that here, so we will not need time domain uh, or time shifted terms rather like like these where the argument is t minus t naught. So instead we'll just use this palette of terms. And again each of these as you probably remember now is a simple exponential term. 1 over s plus a, the inverse transform, is e to the negative a t. And again, if you don't remember that, you can look it up. But again, it is good to memorize that. OK, so I'll need now um, two exponential terms. And I also need constants out front. So I'm going to first put a constant, then an exponential term. And then, don't forget, we need that unit step function. If you forget that, um, then it would be marked wrong, generally, because that is required in the answer. Um, Alternatively, you can use, again, this bracket term and put everything inside the brackets, multiplying one unit step function. But I'm just going to use individual ones here for simplicity. So I have that. Um, and then, well, let's use a minus sign here since we know this is going to be negative. And then uh, we have an exponential, well, a constant times an exponential function times another unit step function. So that's the pattern that we need. And now we'll just fill in the blanks. So the first constant is just the 2. And then the coefficient in the exponential will be 12. So we have e to the negative 12t. Now remember that an answer that would have, for example, e to the plus 12t wouldn't really make any sense because that would be blowing up as a function of time. And unless you're dealing with something such as an unstable system, for example, that's not normally going to happen. So you should always um, have your eyes wide open if you see something like an e to the 12t. That's a red flag that something may be very, very wrong in terms of writing your answer. So you always want a decaying exponential because as t goes to infinity here, then you get e to the negative infinity, which is going to be 0. And that's normally what these functions should do uh, because after all, these are transient terms. They should be dying out normally as a function of time. Okay, so the next one, um, I put a minus sign there, so this will then be a 1. Um, if I put a plus sign, then I would have entered negative 1 here. It doesn't really matter uh, which way we do it. And then the, the a here will be just the 10 because we have e to the negative 10t. And once again, we wouldn't normally want to have e to the plus. Uh, and you know, th these exponentials actually have a negative sign already built in, but if you put a negative value inside, that's where you would likely have a problem. Okay, so let's check that. And that is correct. And once again, we can view a detailed solution if you like. I'm showing you all the steps in that just as a matter of review. And that completes the easy level on this exercise.